he is by nature led to peace so perfect that the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels. Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today we will be reading the poem by William Wordsworth, Old Man Traveling, Animal Tranquility and Decay, a sketch. Now this is the shortest poem in Lyrical Ballads, the 1798 version that we are exploring. We are only about three poems away from completing the entirety of the book, the 1798 Lyrical Ballads by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Now, this is also different. This poem is different in a variety of ways. It's one of the few that isn't in the uh, same meter as many of the other ones in terms of being a lyric or a ball or a lyrical ballad. So that is in, in a lyric or the old ballad, you know, meters that we've been talking about. This is an iambic pentameter, so it's more the the uh, blank verse of uh, Homer for instance, in, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, it's a very short poem, and I want to just read it to you as a, as a beginner, and then we're going to go into it. But what I want you to, to think about is, there's two things I really want to explore today. Is one, what really art is and what it does and what it's supposed to do. So what separates this, you know, it's called a sketch, but what separates it from, let's say I'm, I'm sitting in a park and I'm watching an old man walking by and I want to paint him, right? <clears throat> or I want to um, write an article about him. And, and so I use certain terms and I d describe him and, and maybe in the article, I even want to have a literary flair because I, you know, some, a lot of newspaper writers you know, see themselves as literary writers and they want to include some of that in, the, in their uh, terminology. So you'll, they might have a flair to it. But is even if it, it has that, is it art? Like what makes something art? And then the second thing is I want to show uh, how in one letter the entire mood of the, a poem can change. So when he, Wordsworth, published this again in 1802, he changed one letter. And it really changes the mood. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so let's read this poem together. If you're watching on either TroubadourMag.com or Facebook or YouTube, you'll see the uh, text on the screen. And if you're just listening, you know I'm going to read it. But be, especially since it's so short, we'll be reading it again and kind of going through it line by line or sentence by sentence. Okay, Old Man Traveling. Animal Tranquility and Decay, a sketch by William Wordsworth. The little hedgerow birds that peck along the road regard him not. He travels on, and in his face, his step, his gait, is one expression. Every limb, his look, and bending figure, all bespeak a man who does not move with pain, but moves with thought. He is insensibly subdued to settled quiet. He is one by whom all effort seems forgotten, one to whom long patience has such mild composure given, that patience now doth seem a thing of which he hath no need. He is by nature led to peace so perfect that the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels. I asked him whither he was bound and what the object of his journey. He replied, Sir, I am going many miles to take a last leave of my son, a mariner, who from a sea flight fight has been brought to Falmouth, and there is dying in a hospital. Okay, the end. Again, a short little sketch, very simple, right? We see this old man just walking by, 
And um, the, the narrator is kind of describing him and what he's thinking about this old man and making some assumptions and beliefs about him. And then he asks him what is, is going on. And it turns out that he's on his way to see his son for the last time who's dying in a hospital. Or we assume it's his last time because he's dying in a hospital. Now, let's go through this and kind of see what he, Wordsworth is doing to set us up, in a sense. He's kind of setting us up. And that's done on purpose because he's, he, part of his goal here, I think, is to shock us into understanding, into a revelation, into you know a, a cathartic moment where it's a, a realization of something going on. And this is one of the romantic methods and desires is to when they shock you, they want to shock you into an understanding of the deep world possible to humans. So if we think about that, we have this human, this person in reality, this object separated from us, right? So we're looking at this man and we're kind of just sketching him out and just kind of uh, objectifying him. And then we realize he has a whole inner world that is just deep and sound and resonating and there's so much going on that the outer world that we're looking at does not reflect in the least so let's go through this and look at how he's kind of setting us up for that mr wordsworth so he says the little hedge first off let me just uh say you know in in uh that his um title is not irrelevant Animal Tranquility and Decay, a sketch. So keep in mind that we're talking about, it's an old man traveling, but we're talking about animal tranquility. So the calmness of uh, tranquil animals and uh, decaying. And there is a little bit of, um, you know, he mentions this in the poem later, envy, which I found envy of the young to the old and the tranquility that they, they hold. And there's something very interesting there, I think, because you know, as a, a young person, you don't really envy somebody who's about to die. But what is enviable is how calm he is. You know, if I was struck down with some disease and I had like a year to live, I don't know if I would be as tranquil as this man. And, and there's a kind of envy in that, I think. And there's also when we learn he's going to his son, we learn that, we're, you know, he, the son is dying and the son is, of course, going to be much younger than the father. So there's a there's an idea there. Will he die as tranquilly as this old man is dying, right? Like, does he have that in him? Now, so anyway, that, you know, it's important to think about the the title is not irrelevant. It was, you know, everything in a poem is important. So if they include a title, you got to take it in cons into consideration. So it says the little hedgerow birds that peck along the road regard him not. Okay. So you got to draw a picture in your mind of this. Here you got a man who, you know, again, there's a narrator watching this scene. He's watching this old man. So how fast is the man moving? I mean, if you run through a, a flock of birds, what happens? They run away, right? Or they fly away. But this guy is moving so slow that these birds that are kind of just looking around and just kind of, they don't even care. They're like, eh, they, they're not moving. So it really sets up how slow this guy is moving. And more than just slow, that he is the, the tranquility is part of that, that he's not disrupting nature. He's not sending it into a shock and everything's flying and brown, you know, like a little child, you know, stomping in the mud, kicking up rocks, throwing everything around. Like that's how a child is very untranquil. And this is an old man who's very slowly just kind of walking calmly down the street or down this road you know, along the road, they regard him not. He travels on and in his face, his step, his gait, his, his one expression. So he's, he's a solitary being. It's not conflicted. He's not like, you know, trying to compose his face, but his arms are all akimbo and flying around and flopping because he's all excited about something. You know, he's not, there's not, it's all a tranquil movement. He's all just one being moving calmly down the road by himself. Every limb, his look and bending figure all bespeak. So this, they all speak out about who, what kind of man this is. And it's a man who does not move with pain, but moves with thought. Now, I don't think that means that he doesn't feel pain necessarily, or that the body isn't feeling any kind of pain. But what it, it's trying to indicate is that 
he's so engrossed in his thoughts that any pain he may feel is not registering. A man who does not move with pain but moves with thought. That's what I think it means. Because he's a you know, his look and bending figure would indicate that he probably feels some joint pain, something. But have you ever been so lost in thought that you just don't feel anything or you, your, your body kind of disappears. And I think that's kind of what Wordsworth is drawing here. In, in this next sentence here, after the M dash kind of indicates that he is insensibly subdued to settle, settled quiet. So insensibly, he doesn't feel anything. His sensations have gone and that subdued him to a kind of settled quiet. So again, he's kind of like this, almost this mechanized motorized, but, but, you know, like an animal, right? Like it, it, it's kind of just going it with through the motions going down this road and you know, just complete in harmony. I mean, that's the stress that we're getting is that he's in harmony with everything, even though he's, his f- figure is bent. He's obviously very old, right? He's um, subdued, subdued to a set of quiet. And he is one by whom all effort seems forgotten. He's not, it doesn't even seem like he's making himself move. It's not, you know, he's forcing himself one foot in front of the other. It's that it's just the way it is. He he just moves in, in again, like a mechanical being, like an animal that just the, this animal is part of, you know, just a picture, you know, feral dogs or, or some kind of pack animals or whatever, just walking miles and miles to the next lake or, or, or birds just flocking in the, in the, the sky all together for miles and miles and miles. And they're just moving. They're just going and, you know, they're not thinking about their pains or their sorrows or problems in their lives. They're just going about their day. So uh, he is insensibly subdued to all, to settle quiet. He is by, he is one by whom all effort seems forgotten. One to whom long patience has such mild composure given that patience now doth does seem a thing of which he has no need. So, that I think is a really interesting thing to say, right? He's so patient, he doesn't even need patience, kind of, right? He is one by whom all effort seems forgotten, one to whom long patience has such mild composure given. So he's been, so he's been patient man for so long, and it has such a mild effect on him that patience doesn't seem a thing of which he has any need for it anymore. He doesn't really need, you know, like you don't need to be told to be, he doesn't need to be told to be patient. It's not even in his repertoire. It's just, it's so you know, integrated into his whole being that it's not really an issue for him. So he's just is, right? And that's kind of the stress is that he just is this perfect animal. Again, think about animal decay, right? Or animal tranquility. There's a stress. It's old man traveling. It's animal tranquility. There's a stress on the animal nature of this man. And Again, this is a narrator just kind of watching. He's like, wow, look at this guy. And he's right next to these, this road with these birds. And you can see the picture of him on, you know, uh, bent over. He's insensible. He doesn't seem to, you know, he doesn't like make a face that his legs are hurting. Right. So he's just not, he's so calm. Like that's kind of the stress that this narrator that's watching this person. So remember, think of a newspaper man. Who's, you know, or maybe not a new, you know, it's not a newsworthy story, but maybe it's, you know, um, some, some, uh, human interest story piece or something like that. And you're just, he's trying to write up this, or he's, he's writing on a pen and paper about this man who's walking by and he's like, he, you know, it's, oh man, he's so patient. Like, I wish more of us could be patient. I wish more people like me, this young person who's always full of ambition and gumption and a guy to get out there and make something of myself. We got to do something. Well, I wish we, you know, we can learn something from this man. Like he's, he's so, he's so patient that it's a mild composure to him. It's just who he is. It's not even, you know, he, he's not excited in any way where we have to tell him to be patient. He's just, it doesn't even seem to be a thing of which he has a need. The concept of patience. He doesn't have a need for that. He is by nature led to peace so perfect that the young behold with envy the young like the newspaper writer behold with envy envy what the old man hardly feels so the old man doesn't even really feel that he doesn't really even feel um peace and perfect it's just 
who he is, right? Like an, an animal doesn't feel um, calm necessarily. It's just, it is. Like it, it's just the way it is. Like a cow that just chews the cud, right? It, just, it doesn't get excited. That's just its nature. It doesn't, it doesn't get excited, right? It's very rare. Like maybe if there's a, an animal, or like a, 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 a lion or something about to grab it, then maybe it'll like, run away. But other than that, its whole nature is just complete calm and tranquility and peacefulness. And so the, the narrator is saying like, wow, that's so peaceful. I wish my life could be in more harmony with myself and the world around me. I, the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels. He doesn't feel, not that he doesn't feel, uh, the, he, he doesn't feel peaceful. It's that he doesn't even feel the need to feel, to think about peacefulness, right? It's not like he needs to be told ever, like you don't need to tell a cow to chill. Right, you don't need to tell a cow to meditate and say, "Hey, can you go in here and go mm, and meditate?" No, the old man doesn't need to sit down and go. Um, he's just peaceful. It's just his state of nature and being. It's who he is, according to the narrator. Now, here's where it gets crazy, or tricky, or artistic. <laughs> the narrator asks him. I asked him whither he was bound. Where is he going? And the object of his journey, and what and what the object of his journey, and he replied, quote, "Sir, I am going many miles to take at a last leave of my son, a mariner, who from a sea fight has been brought to Falmouth. That's a uh, a hospital that you would take uh, uh, injured merchants and, and mariners." who from a sea fight has been brought to Falmouth and there is dying in a hospital. Now think about that whole thing we just saw about him. Is he peaceful? How could he be peaceful? Why is he peaceful? Why is he moving so slow? <laughs> He's moving slow. What does that say about the man? Is there something wrong with this man? Why isn't he running? Why isn't he buying a, a cart, a, a horse, or, or some kind of traveling mechanism to get to his son? What if he doesn't make it in time? There's now a ticking clock here in this story that we didn't have before. So we have this man who's moving agonizingly slow now. What we once saw as peaceful, calm, tranquil, we now see as what the hell are you doing, <laughs> right? Like, and this is where I think the artistic element comes in. Because now Wordsworth, with these one, two, three, really four lines, the quotation by the, um, by the man. So we finally learn something about the man, the old man. We now have this idea that, well, hold on. What, who is this guy? What's going on in his life? Why is he doing this? And, and this is what makes it art. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that a, a human interest story would, couldn't you know, talk about this or, or talk about the contrast between the way he was walking and how he um, is feeling in, in his inner world. But what, an inner, what a human interest piece might do is kind of interview him um, and they might talk to him about what, what he's feeling and get his information. And then the narrator, you know, the, the newspaper writer or the writer would talk all about, oh, this man is poor. He doesn't have the money to do it. He's 92 years old and his bones don't work properly. You know, he lost his, um, you know, the only traveling stick he had was stolen from him by some young, young punks, um, you know, he got robbed along the way with a little bit of money he had. So he's trying to conserve his energy. Uh, he only has a little, he only has like four pieces of bread left and he's got 22 miles to go, you know, and his son uh, was killed or, or uh, injured in a sea fight against during the, the French, the war from Britain and France. And it was due to this political bill that was passed that, that, you know, drafted his son. And then it would go on the human interest story. We go on to this story about how his son was drafted. How his son didn't really want to fight. He was a peaceful man. You know, it would go on and on and on and on about all this background and give you all this information. Well, now it's not art. See, this is art. The reason this is art is because it forces you to contemplate 
And that's all it does. It doesn't ask you to think about a political situation. It doesn't tell you to, to, you know, oh, it doesn't have a call to action. Oh, by the way, you should give to your charitable institutions nearby. It doesn't do anything like that. It forces you. If you're awake and reading this poem, it forces you to question who is this character for yourself and to go back into the poem and understand, you know, all the things that are going on in the poem with the information, right? He's moving slow. Maybe he has, you know, so read it again and maybe it's going to color the tone of the poem slightly to know what's going on. And also the realization, the, the other part that that's important here is that you, if you're reading it carefully, like the, um, like the narrator, the, the, the man who's writing this little sketch, you should come to the same realization that he does. You have, you're kind of going through the journey that the narrator is. And then he realizes too, of course, at the end, like, oh my gosh, your, your son is dying. Like that's the last line. So this narrator who made all these assumptions about the peacefulness of him and what was going on may have a second thought about what's actually happening there. So when we see this whole thing, you know, the, the hedgerow birds that are pecking along the roads, they regard him not, you know, he's tranquil, but it doesn't reflect his inner world necessarily. The man has a serious purpose in his life right now. In this moment that we are watching with these birds not flocking away, his inner world is a turmoil. It is a, a, um, a tempest, a huge, oh, you know, a tsunami of emotions. He travels on, and in his face, his step, his gait is one expression. Every limb, his look, and bending figure all speak of man who does not move with pain, but moves with thought. So his body doesn't even exist. It's only his inner will to get to his son. This all changes now. It's his inner will to get to his son. He is insensibly subdued to settled quiet because he's so focused on this goal, nothing exists. But his body isn't capable of getting there any faster. He's putting, he's putting all the energies that he has left into his body. Remember, he's an animal tranquil, but he's also a decay. Animal tranquility and decay. It's about him dying. So he's dying. His son is dying. They're both dying. That's what the poem is now about. The poem is about death. And he's going to be getting, you know, he's, he's kind of walking to his own death. When his son dies, you could imagine that the father's not going to be long bef you know, before he dies. He is one by whom all effort seems forgot, one to whom long patience has such mild composure given that patience now does, uh, now does seem a thing of which he has no need. He has no need for patience. Of course he doesn't have need for patience. He's trying to get there as fast as he can, but he doesn't have the money. He doesn't have you know, the, the things necessary to get there any faster. He is by nature led to peace so perfect that the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels. Even that has another connotation to it now. Now we have a layer of the young dying man who can behold the peace that his father has in dying or that the old man has in dying. We should all be so tranquil and peaceful when we die. And there is a sense of that that's important in this element, in this poem here of, of he is peaceful even though he's dying and his son is dying. And there's a, there's a feeling of peace with him, or he's at peace. And then, of course, we go into the narrator asks him whether where, where he is bound, where he's going, and what is the object of his journey. And then the man says he's going to see his son, a last leave of my mariner. And the last thing I wanted to say was that one letter in this changes a lot of this. It doesn't change it 100%, but it shades it 100% differently. So it's not like everything completely changes and it doesn't make any sense or anything. It's just that one letter changes the whole emotional uh, resonance of this. I think it's better the way it is now, but there was a lot of critique of this po of a lot of his poetry that he, um, and in particular, it was critiqued that it shouldn't be quoted by the, the, old man so much because it, it made it sound like the man was a talking animal, right? So that before he was just an animal 
And now he's an animal, but he also has, you know, quite eloquent speaking ability. So that kind of changes things. So there was less of that, you know, the lines are the same, but it's more the narrator who is saying it, um, you know, for the, the person, you know, he's just saying, he replied, sir, I'm going many miles to take. So it's like, it's, you know, reiterate through him, through him. But the, the main, the only word that changed is a letter. And that letter is the lot in the last line, instead of saying, um, and there is dying in a, in a hospital, it says, and there is lying in a hospital. So even though it's still a last leave of my son who, who you know, from a sea fight has been brought to Falmouth and there is lying in a hospital, it doesn't quite have the strength and the, the horror that you feel that you got to go faster. Like he's lying there. Maybe he's dying, and and it also changes it because the um it, it also could be possible that he's not dying, and that the he's injured, but the the old man who's traveling is dying now. So before it was one hundred percent clear that the son is dying, and probably the old man is dying soon after, but if you change that word to and there is lying in a hospital, which is the et o two version, then the son is not going to die. The last leave of my son, you know, I'm going many miles to take a last leave of my son. Well, that last leave of my son is that my son is injured, but I'm dying. So I need to go see him now before I'm dead my last time. And he can't come to me. So now it it paints an even different picture where, you know, he should, he's not capable, you know, it emphasizes in this new interpretation that he can't move any faster and that, you know, it's the death thing. It's almost like he's having this, it's almost like you could imagine him, you know, starting off some at a somewhat sa- fast saunter and then he slows down because he's he's like crawling into his grave. And then he's going to see his, you know, you can hope that he makes it to his son and there's a kind of anxiety about that. And then once he does, you know, it's, it's he's very, you know, it, hopefully he does. We don't know if he does, of course. We don't know if he ever makes it to his son. But we can imagine that he does, and then he dies shortly after, but he gets to see his son, and his son gets to see his father one last time. But you could see that that makes a huge difference uh, if the son is lying in a hospital versus if the son is dying in a hospital. And now I like the first one because it has the death element in both of them, which colors the entirety of the poem and allows us to see it in a different, see him in uh, so many different lights that is uh, relevant for our own lives because we often see the world in the way that the narrator sees it, where we, we make assumptions about these people. But what the narrator is kind of pointing out is that there is a whole inner world that we are completely unaware of. And this is the romantic flair objective that we've been talking about. One of the big romantic objectives is to explore the inner world of the individual. That's to say that there, you know, we we only see outer surfaces of everything but our own inner world, but there is so much inside each and every one of these individuals, just like there is inside of you. And you may not even know how deep and complicated your own inner world is, which is why you need romantic literature. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.